Hello everyone and welcome to part two of my fantastic interview with Maxwell Alexander Drake, the author of Dynamic Story Creation. Part one of this interview was posted last week. If you haven't watched that already, make sure to go check it out. I've linked it in the description and also in the cards. In this interview today, we are going to be breaking down his chapter outlines, talking about all of the different things that he has to outline in order to write an effective chapter, from the point of view of that chapter to all of the reversals and the turns and the shifts in power and the major theme and the answer to the major theme that this chapter poses. So if this all sounds interesting to you, make sure to watch this video. It is jam-packed with useful information and I hope you find it as helpful as I did. So without further ado, let's continue watching. So I do write all of my chapters, which I do not call chapters, I call them scenes because mm -hmm. you can have multiple scenes in a chapter. So to avoid confusion, I just call them scenes. Mm -hmm. So I do write all my scenes in their own word document. So this is chapter one of the, of the Genesis, the first one. So the weird thing, just to kind of catch everybody up. So this is the first book that I ever had published. It's won numerous awards. Um, the publisher went out of business when I was working for Sony. I never got the third book to them. Then I had my health issues. Um, I am not this writer anymore. So I actually rewrote it from scratch. The first two books came out and I wrote the third book, but now I have rewritten the first book. It's coming mm -hmm. out in June and I'm rewriting the second book and I'll have to rewrite the third book. So this is the rewritten version of the original. Okay. Um, the original is off the market. You can, or, you know, out of print, you can buy it in the used market or whatever, because it's, it's everywhere, but uh, you can't buy it new. Um, or you can wait until June and get the, the really good version. Um, <laughs> me. So, so this is the chapter. Um, I don't write any of this until I have, I plot it out first on a, on a board. And then um, from there, I have what I call my chapter breakdown sheet. So the chapter down break, breakdown sheet, like I said, I said it earlier, it's very, very detailed. So I have the POV, I have the synopsis, you know, this is what everybody, normally this is all anyone ever writes, but then I have my major theme. Now this is not going to change to the whole novel. Is it worth it to sacrifice yourself to fit into society? Just talked mm -hmm. about that. And then is the theme answer proven yes or no? No, it's not. Because if you're different, you're only going to die lonely. So no reason about that's, that's what this chapter, and again, it's very, very you know, undertone because this is the opening chapter. Mm -hmm. But now I've got my minor themes, slavery, slave mentality, injustice, self-reliance, depression. What is my turn? Uh, so a turn I can get into, but um, you have revelation turns, action turns. This is a revelation turn. He realizes that he can only die. Like he has nothing. It doesn't really matter. Mm -hmm. What's the main hook? Now, this is the main hook of the, the, the scene. This is what the reader is going to be hooked by through the whole scene. I have a reason for my chapter. This is what the story needs this scene. If I can't come up with something that the story needs the scene for, then I'm not going to write it. Um, I keep up with their mental state, their driving uh, force and their goal. Where's the scene start and finish? What's the weather? I list every character in the scene. I have my driving conflict of the scene, which can be the same as the character's driving conflict, but it doesn't always happen to be the same. So I, that's why I keep them separate. But a lot of times, I would say 80% of the time, these are the same. Um, what is the resolution? What am I going to do at the end of this? I do keep up with what questions are readers going to ask when they're done with this, because mm -hmm. I play off of that. I want to think about what I'm posing that you're not going to know, that you're going to be like, mm, man, what's going to happen next? Because that's the driving factor that makes you read the next chapter. Mm -hmm. Then I do the breakdown. This is the beats of the chapter. Um, and then I do my reversals, which we've kind of talked about a little bit. Um, you should have in every novel, you should have about 10 or 12 major reversals. I try to have minor reversals in every one of them. So like in this one, they're very minor. He starts as a prisoner, but he's mentally independent, but then something comes along and it actually takes control of his mind for the first time. And it's the first time that, that anybody's invaded that solitude, which is literally the only thing he's ever had in his entire life that mm -hmm. was his. And so now he's like, oh, wow, I don't even have my own mind. Like, screw you people. Everything sucks. So mm -hmm. at least he starts off kind of you know, yeah, I'm a slave and yeah, I'm in this cage, but you know, I'm still me. And then he's like, oh yeah, I'm not even me. Like I, I you literally can rape anything you want on me. Um, and so that's the reversal. It's not major, mm -hmm. it's a minor reversal. So before I start writing this, this book has 68 chapters. So I had 68 of these chapter breakdown sheets. Okay. Now here's the thing. They were not filled out at this level of detail. 
-hmm. I put as much as I can while I'm thinking about it, while I'm plotting it. I do try to come up with whatever, but you know, maybe I don't come up with every minor theme. I come up with one or two. Like I know I'm going to be dealing with slavery and slave mentality. I know that going in because he's a slave, but maybe I don't know about injustice. Maybe I don't know a self-reliance or depression or anything like that. Um, I've written my um, synopsis. So I kind of know what's going to happen. So maybe I can get my minor themes from there. Maybe I can't. I don't know if I know all the reader questions, blah, blah, blah. I don't know if I know every character because as I'm writing, I'm kind of writing on the fly, yeah. letting the muse do her thing. So things are going to change. Right. But I do try to fill this out to the level that I want. And then yeah. how I write. So I talked about there, there's disadvantage to being a plotter. Mm -hmm. One of the big disadvantages is you become rigid. You have plotted and then you just refuse to change. Even yeah. if the muse is like, dude, there's a better way to do it. You, you really screwed up. You didn't think about this. You're like, nope, not going to do it. I'm going to do it the way. That is that is where you screw up as a plotter. That's your biggest yeah. seal. So I'll throw away. I have no loyalty to anything that I've read. I mean, I'm rewriting this entire series over again from scratch. Right. I have literally no loyalty. Um, so I fill this out as, as best as I can. When I'm getting ready to write, I will read this before I write. And then I never look back at it again, ever. Mm -hmm until it's finished, until I finish that first draft of chapter, I don't go back and go, oh, what was that thing? Because I don't want to. If I can't remember it, then it may not have been that important. And okay. so I read it before I start writing and then that's it. I never, ever, ever go back to the chapter breakdown sheet while I'm doing that first draft. And so then I go up to line one um, and I start writing. And I'm a method writer because I'm a method actor. So there's actually a process that I do before I write. So once I read the chapter breakdown sheet, I spend about three to five minutes becoming the character. I close my eyes. I know what their motivation is. I know the scene. I know all that. And so I start, first I start feeling the character. I start feeling what the character's feeling, what they're motivated for, what their desires are, what they're afraid of, what the situation is. When I feel like I've got a good grasp of their emotions and everything like that, and I'm becoming the character, I start feeling the environment. Um, I start feeling, I always start with temperature. I don't know why, but I'll start feeling what the temperature is around me. I'll start smelling things. I'll start hearing things. You know, if I can taste something, I start tasting it. Um, once I feel like I've got a good grasp of those senses, I will then, the character will open their eyes. My eyes are still closed, but the character opens their eyes. The scene is frozen. And at, now I'm pretty much the character. And I start walking around looking at stuff. And I go, oh, look what that guy's wearing. And I'll look where that's at. And I'll look at this architecture. And, and so I spend a few minutes looking at things. And then when I feel like I've got a really good grasp of my surroundings, I reset to where the character goes back to where their starting point is. Mm -hmm. And then I open my eyes and I just, I am the character and I am in the scene and I am just writing it and the world disappears. It's kind mm -hmm. of what happened when I was five minutes late to this meeting because I was doing something and I'm, when I'm doing something, the world is lost. I don't, yeah. I don't, the world just doesn't mean anything to me. Yeah. And so I write it. I do my first draft. Now, my first draft is usually just dialogue and action. I don't write a lot of descriptions and I don't write a lot of emotions. I don't write those are, I have different drafts that do different things. As I've gotten better writer, you know, as I've been doing this for, you know, 30 years, I, I put more detail in my first draft. I put more emotion in my first draft. I put more, but, but definitely back in the beginning, it was nothing but dialogue and action mm -hmm. and nothing else. Now I'm a much stronger, more robust writer. So my first draft is much more robust. When I finish writing, the first, so I actually do five passes and I don't know if anybody should do this because they tell you not to, but it's the way I do it. So when I finish my first draft, I don't call that my first draft. I actually do five different passes through it to call it my first draft. Mm -hmm. And I do them all in one sitting. So I write, cause I can write six, seven, 8,000 words in a couple hours. Um, so I write the first draft. The very first thing that I do at that point when I'm finished is I go down to the chapter breakdown sheet and I edit it and I add to it on all the stuff that I just learned. And I, and while I'm doing that, I'm getting new ideas for the chapter that I just wrote. Mm -hmm. And so I'm filling this out and I'm fleshing it out and I'm adding things to it and I'm changing things and thinking about things differently. As soon as I do that, I do my first editing pass. I do four editing passes on top of it, but each one of them looking at different things. So like the next thing it's, it's all about what do things look like? Mm -hmm. What does that look like? What does this look like? I kind of also do what do things feel like? So mm -hmm. I'll do emotions in that pass too. I do a, a pass that's just dialogue. So I've got, um, here's how insane I am. So like I have my own special macros that I've made. So like one of the things that I do is a dialogue pass. So to do the dialogue pass, what I'm doing is just reading dialogue. So I run my dialogue macro and it goes through and it highlights all of my dialogue and inner monologue. Wow. And that's it. And then I can go through and I can go um, and I can skip all the narration. 
Um, so I can now just go through and I can just read my dialogue, my inner monologue, inner monologue, inner monologue. Now it does the inner monologue it, it, part of it actually just highlights anything that's high, that's um, italics. Uh, yeah. So I do have to skip a few words, uh, but for the most part, most of my italics is going to be inner monologue. And right. then it highlights everything between quotes. So, oh. you know, that's, that's what it's doing. It's looking for all that. And now I'm just reading. And the reason why I do this is I want to decide, does the dialogue move the scene without any narration at all? That's mm -hmm. why I don't read any narration. So, you know, if I can read the, the, just the dialogue and go, yeah, no, I, I know exactly what happened in the scene. I know what the emotions of everybody. I know what everybody's thinking. I don't even have to read any of this, this narration because all that means is now that the dialogue carries the scene and the narration just makes it that much better. Now, obviously, if it's a heavy action scene or something like that, guys fighting and there's no dialogue, dialogue's yeah. not going to move that scene. Um, but I go through and, and so I do one of my passes on that one of my passes on, um, I have, if you look up here, I have different things like I do look for my prepositions because I overuse prepositions. So that's one thing I have a bad words list. So if I get rid of, um, if I get rid of that, I have words um, that are my bad words. Now, these are words specific to me, but I go through now this chapter is heavily edited. So all these bad words that are in here are in here because I've looked at them. And I'm like, nope, that's good. I like that. We're going to leave that. They're mm -hmm. all different colors. And so they all mean different things. Um, some of them are filtering words. Some of them are um, um, like uh, light blue is redundant motions. So mm -hmm. moved and gazed and shifted and turned and nodded and all of those that sometimes you accidentally overuse. I'm mm -hmm. not going to cut all of them. I'm just going to make sure that there's not, you know, yep. there's not a whole bunch of them right next to each other as I'm going through. Mm -hmm. so that's what the light blue is the, the green means something else the purple means something else and so on and so forth um and so that's one of my drafts i'm, I'm kind of just really focusing on every individual sentence and going wow okay that's a bad word do i really want to use like dark purple is stage direction mm -hmm. um it kills me and some people are like you know he punched him in the face and then he kicked him in the in the in the nads and then he went yeah. up like i hate the then and list it and i have such a bad habit of that in first drafts i always need to go yeah, back and get rid of it, that it, it has to happen then i'm reading it in order it's not like mm -hmm. like if, if this sentence happens after that sentence then this is then and that's <laughs> before like why are you telling me then but sometimes so like the keeper snorted before bending to open this like okay stage direction but that's not there's nothing wrong with that uh, once again, he peered through the bars. Okay, he's returning to the bars. That's stage direction, but I'm, I'm fine with that. Mm -hmm. So here's another before. And yeah, that's two before is fairly close, but I've made the decision. I'm fine with it. Mm -hmm. So again, everything's by design and on purpose. Yeah. So I, and I also, I'm, one of the things I'm doing in this draft or this version. So when I did, when I wrote it originally, uh, so Farmers and Mercenaries was the ninth book that I had written in my life, but it was the first book that got published. Mm -hmm. And I wanted to write accents and the publisher, that, that's something that publishers frown upon. They're like, nope, you could, you don't write accents. Accents are, and, and I get it. They are, they can be jarring. Mm -hmm. But since I'm actually doing this as an indie press, because I do have a fairly large fan base and I've got a team behind me and a marketing team and everything else, I don't need a publisher anymore. And mm -hmm. so I'm, I'm self-publishing all this <clears throat> or indie publishing. So I want to go back to my accents. I like my accents. And so one of the things that I do is I want to be consistent with my accent. So I actually do have, um, you know, once I run my dialogue, then I have my accent. So I can run, like there's a Rorthian guy in here and it will highlight things that I need to pay attention to. Now, Clayne mm -hmm. doesn't speak with a Rorthian accent. So things that, um, well, this guy's actually uh, Kamarian. Uh, I'm sorry, Silouayan. So it's marking the red in here because of, I'm only looking at Rorthian accents. So Rorthians don't say my, they don't say yes, they don't say no, they don't say will, they don't say into. So that's why it marks all those because it's wrong. But if we go up here to this guy called the keeper, who is, um, who is, oh wait, we're way, we're way down. Do you program all these things yourself? Um, I would love to take credit for that. Um, I know I'm not that good of a programmer, but I've got friends who are, like the last thing that I really want to do. Uh, so the accents used to do the entire document. So it would even find things in narration. And I really wanted to just do what was highlighted. And mm -hmm. I just had a really good friend of mine who's an amazing programmer. Mm -hmm. I had talked to her and I was like, hey, could you do this for me? And she's like, yeah, send it to me. So mm -hmm. she gave me a little code to add to it literally just this week, um, or really just last week, that now that it only highlights inside 
of anything that is uh, highlighted yellow. Because so cool. um, otherwise I was just ignoring it. So if it marked something here, I would just ignore it. And I would just look at what was there. Right. But I really wanted to not have to ignore that stuff. So no, I'm not a, an amazing programmer. I know what I want. I know what I want it to do. I want to take advantage of Word's power um, because Word has the ability to do all this stuff. But yeah. I've, I've had other people help me with a lot of this. I mean, this is, yeah. I've been doing this macro for over 10 years at least. Mm -hmm. You know, this is something I've used for a long time. Yeah, no, um, I mean, I would love to do something like this, but I've been using Pro Writing Aid because that's kind of the way so to I also, do things. I like actually it. use Pro Writing Aid. That's a, that is something that I've added to my, my very, very, very final draft. Um, I actually throw it into Pro Writing Aid. I don't <laughs> use it for a lot. A lot of Pro Writing Aid is stupid, in my opinion, mm -hmm. but I do like it for, first of all, gr the grammar. Yeah, the grammar does, is awesome. It does find some, you know, grammatical errors that I might have missed or whatever, and I will, I use it for that. Um, I really do like the, um, the whatever they call it the repetitive word use the, yeah like. the overused thing yep. i use that all the time and i and i like the echo yep. um i use those i don't use much else in it mm -hmm. um you know I, I always pay attention to my readability anyway but word mm -hmm. does that so i'm always at a high fourth grade level or low fifth grade reading level yeah. um that's where you should hit as a as a adult writer you should be in that because you don't want your reader struggling to read. You want yeah. them to see the thing and, and high fourth, low fifth is where you know that your readers are just gonna get immersed in the words. So I always do that. So sure, it tells me that, but but see pro writing age does stuff like, so like Overmorrow, mm -hmm. uh, he'll be dead before Overmorrow. Now Overmorrow is, an, is actually English, but it's a word that hasn't been used in 150 years. It means day right. after tomorrow. Yeah. It means tomorrow, it means day after tomorrow. Um, so, like because it's fantasy i like to use a couple little fantasy words plus i have probably 300 words that i've made up in this right. world and then especially when you get into um 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 like the roarthian um so like they don't say several different versions of you the only one they do say is use um so this is clean talking so it marks a whole bunch of red because he's not roarthian but if you notice it since I'm paying attention to what the Rarthian is saying. Um, and this is the correct use of that, but I still have to mark all my use just to make sure. So mm -hmm. that's how I kind of keep up with everything. Um, but if you look at all of um, all of his stuff, the only time it is, is when, so like they drop a lot of G's. Mm -hmm. So that's why it marks the ings, but he's not gonna, I'm not gonna write the word sin ya, pray any praises that's not gonna read well. So I made the choice to leave the G, but that's not a word, that, you know, they drop yeah. G's like, um, uh, morning or you know whatever mm -hmm. I was thinking so they, they don't say thinking they say thinking yeah um so I use my macros to help me make sure that I don't miss anything that I'm you mm -hmm. know really paying attention to this stuff and yep. delivering the the final product that I want to deliver mm -hmm. so yeah um so I just bounce back and forth. every time I do a draft just to get back to it sorry um I'm just really proud of my macros especially now it's that I finally so cool. got yeah. leave the way I want them uh, I mean, just to show you how insane it is, you know, you're going to make all my subscribers really jealous. <laughs> here is, you know, this is the entire, all those macros that you see up there. Here's all the code for it. Wow. Um, so it is extensive, but, um, but yeah, if somebody wants it, send me an email, I'll send you the macro in a text file. Um, you just have to really, you just create a macro, um, but don't do anything with it. And then once you do that, it'll be listed in here and then you just hit edit. And you just highlight everything and delete it and take my text document and just drop it in there okay. and then save it. But you do want to make it, um, you do want to make it um, customized to you. So like my bad words list, these are bad words that I overuse. And so to add words to these lists, like, you know, if, if you do filtering words that you don't want to do, mm -hmm. you just add them to this list. It's just a huge, gigantic, long list. Oh, perfect. Uh, perfect. Same thing with, um, you know, glue words mm -hmm. um, that I might overuse or, uh, bad emotions or uh, overused movements. And I do, I do, I'm very, like my whole life is chaos. If I turn the camera around and you look at my office, it is thrashed. I, I organize nothing in my life mm -hmm. except for writing. I am so <laughs> insanely organized when it comes to my writing and stories, mm -hmm. everything in life. I'm, I'm totally, completely unorganized on, but I am over organized. And when it comes to writing, um, and I think it's because I have to be because I'm so chaotic. Um, but anyway, so 
um, I do my first draft. I edit the, the the breakdown sheet. I come back and do the, the the next draft. I then immediately edit the breakdown sheet. I then do the the third, the fourth, the fifth, and I just bounce back and forth. And each one, when I'm writing, I'm getting new ideas that are going to be added to the breakdown sheet. When I'm doing the breakdown sheet, I'm getting ideas to add to the writing. When I'm writing, I'm getting ideas through. And so I'm just bouncing back and forth between the two. And in one day, I write a five or six thousand word chapter, doing five versions of it. You know, five drafts of it. Um, I used to make everything um, its own. Every time I do a draft, I would save it as a different number. But because I'm now storing everything on my OneDrive and everything like that, I'm taking advantage of the fact that it has um, your um, your version history. Oh yeah. So if I ever do actually, like actually, it was funny. One of my beta readers was reading this chapter when it was finished, and somewhere in here, no, no, I'm sorry, it was it was his next chapter. It was his fight scene chapter, but like 600 words got cut. Like, it was just like, if you just took 600 words and just deleted them. And so I didn't notice that. And I don't know how it happened, but it happened a while ago because I had to go like three or four versions back mm -hmm. to find the chapter that had those six or 700 words. It was right, right in the middle of the fight scene. Mm -hmm. So when my beta reader was reading it, he actually reached out and he's like, um, there's something wrong here because he's getting ready to start the fight. And mm -hmm. then the guy's dead. Like, um, what happened in here? And so I was right. like, holy crap. So normally I would have had my individual versions, but now that I'm using OneDrive, I just use the power of the previous versions. I was able to go back, grab it. Um, same thing if I write a chapter, and this has never happened, but I always say this because again, I'm too organized for my own good. But like if I ever write a chapter that I don't like or a, a, a paragraph that I don't like and I like the old version, I can go back and get it. Yeah. Um, I've never done that. I mean, if I'm gonna change up some, the way something's written, it's because I want it changed and I, I yeah. like it better. Um, but literally that just happened maybe in the last month where I somehow 700 words got chopped out of the middle of a fight scene. I have no idea how. And so now I just use that. And then one drives, you know, obviously on the cloud, it's all backed up. I don't have to worry about it. Um, so that's really so a long way to get to your answer. No, I do not write a perfect chapter breakdown sheet before I start writing. I do as much as I think I possibly can. I come up with every idea. I throw it all in that chapter breakdown sheet. Then I move to the next chapter breakdown sheet and the next and the next and the next. Yeah. I do all of them for the entire novel before I write the, the book mm -hmm. so that I know every little thing. And that chapter breakdown sheet doesn't start there. That would be impossible. I actually start on a board with post-it notes and yeah. each scene is just one little post-it note. Mm -hmm. So like this one would be, you know, his name is Claim, but in, he doesn't know his name in the beginning. So he's called the Beast through this one. And he's called the Beast for the first couple of chapters until he learns his name. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, there's reasons for it. But anyway... So it would be clean and sell. That's literally what I would write on there. And mm -hmm. then I would know I, that would be enough shorthand for me to then be able to create that chapter breakdown sheet. Mm -hmm. But I don't want to create the chapter breakdown sheet yet because I might cut that scene. Right. I need to plot it all out first. And then I'll go to the next one and be like, oh, mm -hmm. clean and fighting in the Coliseum. And then clean after the fight. Um, basically, he's all happy because some amazing thing happens to him in the arena. And his boss, his, his owner comes and is like, you know, unfortunately you did too well. And now, um, you know, the parents of this guy that you killed wants to buy you to chop your nuts off. And you know, the parents of this guy that you killed wants to buy you to make a rug out of you. And man, mm -hmm. it's worth a lot of money. It's going to be so awesome. And of course that really pisses clean off when he's like, I did this, like you couldn't have done better. And now I get to, you know, get used as a rug, like screw you. Um, and so he goes nuts and they just beat the crap out of him until he's unconscious. Mm -hmm. um so you know i that's what on the post it was like gets his ass kicked yeah because i already knew kind of the flow i didn't know exactly what was going to happen when i'm in that stage mm -hmm. i fleshed that out once i'm happy with the flow of the story on the post -it notes yep. then i come into the chapter breakdown sheets and i start fleshing them out when i do it as far as i think i can um and i and i'll come back to them like maybe i'll get into the third or fourth uh scene of that character and i'll realize that I have to do something in a previous scene or this doesn't work. So I'll go back, I'll open that chapter breakdown sheet, I'll add that in, I'll come back. But I really do try to flesh out as much as I possibly can when I'm done with that, then it's time to just write the book. And that's why I said a pantser can't do this. Because if you had all this knowledge ahead of time and you're a pantser, you'd be like, yep, I'm done. I don't want to write that story. Yeah. But as a plotter, I can't write it without this. Mm -hmm. I can't I just can't. I'm terrified of a blank page. And but it's still is, super helpful for pantsers also to use this as a revision tool. Like you can pants your first draft and then look at it with a critical eye and then yeah. you fill out all the chapter sheets and everything to see what yeah. your story really is. 
the only other thing I'd like to show since we have this, this open, which I think is one of the most important aspects of this. So again, I'm a why guy, so it's always why. Mm -hmm. Why am I going to a writer's group? Well, it's not for you know, somebody to show me that I missed a comma or I misspelled a word, yeah. which is what a lot of writer's groups end up being. Mm -hmm. What you really want to do with a writer's group is, and yes, if you're missing commas because you don't understand it, then yes, the writer's group needs to be there to help you that. Or if you're, if you're, um, and you don't know what a preposition is and a preposition mm -hmm. phrase and you're overusing them, yes, you want the writer's group to help you with that because you're not to the level where you should be producing for uh, publication. Yeah. But once you are there, like my beta readers very rarely find anything. Like they don't even find a sentence where they're like, man, this is a rough sentence. I really, because I've already gone through it so many times and I'm a strong enough writer that I know that my sentences are like butter. Um, so what I do is I have my beta questions and these are vitally important to me. Um, now this gets turned into a PDF to go out to the beta reader. So it actually has a fillable box that gets mm -hmm. put here um, because I don't want to send them a Word document. So I just send them the PDF. But these are, when you, when you get somebody to read your chapter and it's something that you think is going to be published, you should be asking very specific questions about that chapter. Not, did I misspell the word, you know, did I miss the word two in this sentence? If yeah. you find it great, pat on the back, awesome. But I also pay a proof editor at the very end of this. Mm -hmm. Like that's her job. She's going to find that damn two. You don't need to tell me that. I mean, if you do, great, I'll put it in there. It's awesome. I don't, I don't ever tell a beta reader not to tell me about it. But what I really want to know from my beta readers is, did I hit what I think I did? Mm -hmm. So the first couple of questions are the same in every chapter. These are, these are standard. They don't get changed. So was there something on the opening page that pulled you in and gave you a desire to keep reading? I wrote something in the first couple of paragraphs that, that I think you're never going to stop reading after that. But that's just me. It doesn't mean that it actually is going to work. So mm -hmm. I want my beta readers. If every beta reader is like, well, and notice they're all open-ended questions. Yeah. They're not yes or no questions. You know, did I hook you on the first page? Because they're going to write yes every time. So I want to know what it is. I, I think I know what it is, but if they, if, if that line keeps showing up, Oh, when I read this line, I was hooked. If that's the line I thought it was, then I know I've done good. Mm -hmm. Same question with the entire chapter. Did the entire chapter make you keep reading it? Were you able to visualize it? Was there anything I could elaborate on anymore? Is it, you know, what did, what did I miss? And yeah. then I get into specifics. So like one of the big questions that I have is I've decided in, in the published version, the original published version, it was just claimed. Mm -hmm. And this one, I really like the idea that he doesn't know. He was taken at two weeks of age. He does not know his name. He's never heard his name, except mm -hmm. for when he was, you know, under two weeks of age, when his mom was saying it to him. How he finds out is the woman who rapes his mind, doesn't do it on purpose. And so she got it because she got everything in his mind. And so she actually tells him his name. So I really like the idea of starting him as just unknown, just no name. And so I named him the beast. And, but that's taking a risk. Anytime you do stuff like this, you're always taking a risk. Yeah. You need to test it out. So I'm asking my beta readers, all right, you're reading a character literally called the beast. Mm -hmm. like, how'd that make you feel? Did it throw you out of the story? You know, what, what, you know, all those questions. Cause I need to know, I need to know what I've done. Um, there's some flashbacks in this one. I need to know if they're confusing, if they, if they actually help you out, do they connect you to the yeah. character? I think they do, but I'm nobody. The reader is everybody. Um, mm -hmm. At the end of the chapter, do you, are you connected to them? Um, did I introduce this character? Were they um, mysterious? What do you think they are? And so on and so forth. I also hide her, it is a her, but I hide her sex. You don't know, it's a really weird alien creature. Mm -hmm. And so I wanna know what their sex is and then what you think the sex of this creature is and why do you feel that way? Mm -hmm. um, because again, I'm playing with the fact that I don't want you to know what sex they are. Yeah. And then these are the same, the last three questions are always the same too. Was there anything that would have, um, or what questions did you have? So again, mm -hmm. if you look at my chapter breakdown sheet, I guess my reader, reader questions. Yeah. And this will change when the beta readers come in. Like, oh, wow, I didn't even think, like if 80% if of them are asking a question that I didn't have down here, I'm like, well, obviously a lot of people are going to ask this question. I'm going to put it down here. Um, but I want to know if I've done my job right. If I've guessed pretty good what, what I think the readers are going to be really be wondering about. And then the last two, would you ever stop reading? Why? And then if you did read it, do you want to read the next chapter? Did yeah. I hook you enough that makes you want to read that next one? Mm -hmm. And why? Right. Because if, if I can't get good answers to those, then I have failed. Yeah. And so if you're in a writer's group, if you're doing any, if you've got beta readers or whatever, don't waste it by, oh, you missed a comma in this mm -hmm. sentence. Don't waste it. Yeah. Ask them specifically. Hey guys, I killed Bob in this chapter. How did that make you feel? Now, mm -hmm. if I 
felt like I made Bob this amazing character that really connected to you. And when I kill him, it broke your heart. If I feel that way. And yet the answer I get back is, oh man, I was so happy that you killed that guy. I hated him. If that's the answer that I get, then um, I've really messed up. <laughs> if I thought that I was actually making you love the character and you're happy to see him die, then I've screwed up. And that's what you need. That's the questions that you need from your beta readers, not that you missed a comma or you misspelled, you know, a word or you missed a two, you know, or an of in your sentence. Quick side tangent. What yeah. advice would you give people to actually make readers connect to characters? Because I know you say in dynamic story creation that your main character is the vehicle for your reader to experience the story. And I know this is a super vague question and it's a really difficult question to answer, but yeah. I've had a lot of people ask me this on the channel before and I've had people give a bunch of different answers. So there's, there's, I divide this industry into two halves. There's the craft of writing mm -hmm. and there's the craft of storytelling. Yeah. Craft of writing, again, I'm an uneducated, dyslexic idiot. If I can do this, anybody can do this. Then there's a the craft of storytelling. Mm -hmm. And it's because this craft of writing is skill. The more time you spend with it, the more you'll learn it, the better you get it. I know you you open the book by giving the brutal writing advice that like there is some like there are things that you can't learn as a writer. There are just things. Some of it is skill. Now you can think yeah. about it. And so if you want, I'll go through, let me just go through like two or three opening chapter or opening lines. Mm -hmm. So really what you're doing is you and 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 all this is subjective. So mm -hmm. this has been tested out. I think that they hook the reader, and my beta readers have convinced me that it hooks the reader, but mm -hmm. For any of your viewers, if we read through this and, and they're like, well, that doesn't do anything for me. Great. It's subjective. That's kind of the point. It's not going to fit. It's you're never going to please everybody. But I'll, I'll open up a couple of chapters and just uh, a couple of introduction chapters. These are because there's five characters in this scene mm -hmm. or in this story and four of them. One of them, you really can't understand the introduction chapter unless you because it's actually so there's the the beast that's in the, the arena fighting and then mm -hmm. the next chapter is a dude watch that was in the stands watching this and, mm -hmm. and his story starts at the end of the fight and so you really don't get a good introduction because the hook is the fact that you're now looking down at the fight you just watched right and so i, I don't want to do that but the other four chapters we can open up we can read mm -hmm. and really what it is is you just have to it's about introducing conflict and a lot of people misconstrue what i mean by that Conflict doesn't necessarily mean me punching you in the face. Mm -hmm. It could be all sorts of things. So let's look at, let's look at this. The dull pain, the dull pain radiating through the beast's neck and shoulders goaded, goaded him from his slumber. He lay with his eyes closed for several moments, hoping sleep would, would retake him. It did not. With a groan, he rolled over on his back and stretched as best he could in the cramped alcove. He'd awakened here for the past two ten days upon a stone slab and a tiny cell tucked beneath the grand coliseum of Mockley. Glaring at the, stone, at the ceiling, he traced the wooden support beams that stretched out like the fingers of a giant hand. The rough-hewn timbers loomed in the deep shadows of, of pre-dawn, foreboding, oppressive, a constant reminder of his master's hold upon him that his life was nothing more than someone else's property. I don't think you can stop reading after that. Mm -hmm. You've got, first of all, everybody's woken up and not wanted to wake up and wanted a little bit more sleep time. So mm -hmm. that kind of connects you into this real human kind of thing. But then you get down to the, oh, wow. Yeah, this guy's owned. And like, I, I need to find out what this is. Mm -hmm. And to me, and, and again, all my beta readers said the same thing. So if you're out there and you're like, that doesn't do anything for me, great. Then this might not be for you. Mm -hmm. um, but that's what I'm trying to do. I'm trying to connect my readers as fast as possible to something that makes you go, well, that's interesting. I want to mm -hmm. find out a little bit more about that. Mm -hmm. um, going, to, going to his opposite, um, because they, are, uh, they bounce back and forth between them. This is a farm boy. Mm -hmm. So this is chapter two. This is actually literally the chapter after the chapter in the, in the, in the cell. Mm -hmm. Our dairy core sat up in bed with a start. Breathing hard, he gazed wide-eyed around his tiny bedroom, focusing on nothing. The dream was similar to those he'd been having for several moons, ever since the strange happenings at last Harvest Talentine Festival. While the details differed from nightmare to nightmare, the terror did not, nor did the outcome. In each, the seers had tested him, and I'd failed. You don't know anything, mm -hmm. but that's, that's enough to make you go, okay, wait, something's going on here. Right. I want to find out more. Mm -hmm. And so it is difficult to think about how we're going to connect our readers as fast as possible to our characters. Mm -hmm. um, um, I'll do one more. 
I love this one. So this is the introduction, that's chapter 13, but it is an introduction of another character. Okay. A list sprinted through the squalid streets of Comar's Wharf District, three drunken sailors scrambling in her wake. Freezing salt air burned in her lungs as she pushed herself to run faster, streaking past one ramshackled building after another. She'd seen, for, she'd seen firsthand the results of what these men had done to the girls they'd caught over the past few 10 days, a blight on her island home. The foul stench of rotting fish hit her nostrils and she gagged, regretting that her business had brought her down here this eve. Finding people willing to help a young girl in distress in this part of town would be impossible, certainly at this time of night. All the shops and many of the bars were closed tight. The only establishments taking patrons this late were, the uh, were of the disreputable ilk. The Sea Witch, the tavern that had vomited out the sailors who chased after her now were one such place. Yeah. I don't think you're gonna stop reading that. Mm -hmm. And all my beta readers were like, yeah, no. Like, I'm going to keep reading. I got to, I got to find out what's going on. Yeah. And that's really what it is. It's, it's about connecting the character or the reader to the characters as fast as possible. Mm -hmm. um, connecting them with some type of conflict with something that endears you to the character, mm -hmm. something that gives you the desire to learn more and to continue reading and then it's just, it's a nonstop raising of tension. Everything has to get more. It's so like in the, in the stupid, our dairy chapter, um, the next thing that happens is his cousin sleeping next to him. And so he's like, you know, he kicks the bed and he's like, come on, we got to go. But his cousin doesn't go get up. He rolls over. And so he has to smack him in the head and he runs downstairs, but that's some tension. That's some conflict. Mm -hmm. He goes downstairs and um, like, like, here's this line. He's like, come on, Papa will break us if we don't, if we miss the wagons. I don't wish to walk out all the way out to the fields again so that's even though you've never met these people this is obviously something that's happened more than once yeah and you know so you got that he gets down to the kitchens um you have a little introduction there um he greets all the women that are in the kitchens and then um crossing to the center work table he reached for a slab of smoked pork resting on a clay tat clay tray before his fingers touch the scrumptious meat he snatched his arm back as a wooden spoon thwacked the countertop narrowly missing his hand our dairy core you know better a tall red-headed girl loomed in front of him so conflict we yep. get that done um he has conflict with his mother a little bit in here nothing major these aren't like fights yeah. um we get into the dining hall he sees his sister for the first time um and they have his sister and his cousin um have some type of argument going because it's just a way to show wow these this family is just as dysfunctional as every other family that i know mm -hmm. so like he says morning to her and she says morning to him. And then she says cousin in a really nasty way. And the cousin says Tari in a really nasty way. And he's like, you, you two got to get over this. And his sister's like, me, not a chance. Not till that oaf apologizes for true this time. And then it just goes into that. And so it's conflict. And it's just, yeah. oh, wow, I've lived life like this. I've you know done all this stuff, but it's more conflict. It's a never ending stream of this conflict's a little bigger than the last conflict, which is a little bigger than the last conflict, which is a little bigger than the last conflict. And, you know, you just keep doing that. You keep doing these humanizing moments. You keep constantly making the character enduring to the reader. And the more you do that, and there's all sorts of ways. I mean, like the Elith chapter that I opened up, she's a soulless killing machine through almost all of book one. Mm -hmm. she's just getting moral compass for the first time because she's not human she's something completely different um and so um she's horrible mm -hmm. she's a horrible she's not bloodthirsty because she has no emotions she has no moral compass nothing's right or wrong to her mm -hmm. but she's working for the bad guys and right. so the things they have her doing is horrible things yeah how do i connect you to that character right so I have to think about that. I have to push you. So like the one of the reasons why I opened it the way I did with her, because she looks like a 16 year old girl. Mm -hmm. She's 110 pounds wet. And these three guys that are coming after her are big and brutal. And you get you you learn that they are rapists and they've been, you know, she's seen plenty of the girls bodies. And I actually described some of them that she's seen. And the way it the way you roll through it is, oh, she was in the crowd when they found the bodies or whatever. What you find out at the end is that she is not afraid of them at all. She's not human. So she's like Superman, basically. She's luring them in the alley, but she does all this stuff because she wants to make sure 100% that these are the guys because mm -hmm. she's there to kill them. And so she lures them in the alley and she says some really weird religious stuff because she's a religious zealot. She quotes from the holy book of this world. And so there's some really weird lines that she spits out. Um, 
But again, it's all about the, the reason why I had her start killing three bad guys mm -hmm. is because after that, she kills a lot of good guys, um, but not because she realizes that there's a good and a bad. She, she's just a sword. Mm -hmm. um, but the decision to write the chapter, because it has nothing, literally, there's no reason for her to kill three rapists in this town because in her, in two scenes later, she teleports away from this town to a completely different continent and her entire story takes place on another continent. Mm -hmm. Why do I, why do I need her to kill these three bad guys? Because she's about to go kill all the good guys that you're also reading about. Like you're with these good guys. And so I knew that the only way I was going to endear my audience to her is if she does something good first. Yeah. Um, and so the bad guys have a city and the bad guys don't like their citizens having bad mm -hmm. things happen to them. So, you know, she has to police that area as well. Um, so these are all just decisions. And again, this is more talent. It's more making these decisions of why you do what you do are more of just really understanding the human equation. Again, it's what I say, you know, I'm, I don't remember if I said it before we started recording or after. So I'll just say it again. The number one thing that you need as a writer is empathy. Yeah. You just have to be able to empathize. And so how do I make my readers connect to this character? How do I use empathy to connect them? You know, and everything is about that. How I connect them to the beast man is through empathy. How I connect them to our dairy. It's a bunch of teenage angst. Mm -hmm. He's worried about, he doesn't want to get married. And that the redheaded girl, you know, not only is she flirting with him and all that, and they're of age now, but when he goes and sits to dinner, he sits or for breakfast, he sits right across from her father and her father's like, so I've married off all my other daughters. There's only one I got left in the house. And you're a really good boy. You know that you're a really <laughs> good boy. And he's like, I don't want, what, why is this happening? Mm -hmm. And so it's just a lot of teenage angst. He's, he's yeah. worried about his test. He's worried about, he's also his, it's his naming day. So on the 17th naming day, they have a big celebration and he's shy mm -hmm. and he doesn't want the whole house doing this big deal for him. And he's thinking about what happened to his cousin who's two months older than him and his older brother's two years older than him and what they had to endure. And like, I don't want to do this. And it's all embarrassing. And, you mm -hmm. know, so it's you just relate to him because everybody's felt that teenage angst. Everyone has felt that that pressure of society that you that they want to do something you're just not ready for you. I'm 17 years old, you know, yeah. and and then you also throw in the fact that it's kind of a communist society that he's in. So you don't no one ever leaves. You're born a farmer, you die a farmer. And he's like, I don't want to do that. And right. he's got his brother who was found to have the gift of magic. And he's two years away. He was whisked away to the big city to go to college. And they're like, I want to do that. Like, right. maybe I don't have magic, but I, I don't want to be here. Like mm -hmm. that, that gave him that glimmer of there's something bigger out there. I don't want to be a farmer. But then mm -hmm. he also is thinking about this stuff in front of his father. And his father's a great man and he loves his father. And so now he's like, shit, I'm such an asshole for doing this. Like, he's a good man. And that's all he's been as a farmer his whole life. Like what, what makes me any better than that? So there's just a right. lot of this internal angst that you go through and nothing happens in that chapter. Mm -hmm. He wakes up, he goes downstairs, he eats breakfast, he goes and catches the wagons to go to work. Mm -hmm. That's it. Nothing happens. And yet at the end of it, I dare you to put the chapter down. If you're into this, you know, into my genre, mm -hmm. um, because you are so connected to that kid and so want to find out what's going on and how, how it's going to unfold and where it's going to be. And, you know, you, you're like, Oh, well, he definitely got magic. And so obviously there's this, and at least you think there is. And, you mm -hmm. know, so it's just a lot of, it's a lot of that. And it's a lot of, it's a lot of understanding the human condition. Yeah. That's really how you connect characters to readers. It's you have to empathize. You have to understand, you have to understand. And I love saying this, the only thing that's real in your story is the reader. Mm -hmm. Nothing else is real. Your characters aren't real. The world isn't real. The conflict isn't real. None of it's real. Mm -hmm. It is all there specifically for one reason, mm -hmm. to impact the only thing that's real, the reader. Yeah. I love my stories, but I don't care about my stories. I only care that my stories impact the reader mm -hmm. because if they don't do that, then, then they're worthless to me. Mm -hmm. so you know I just I truly believe you know in that concept and I think that's the reason why most people that read my stuff fall in love with it because they're impacted by it at every turn every paragraph like I said I love to write them like not only do I write the the novels as a Jenga tower on its last game I write the scenes as if they're a Jenga tower on their last move 
Well, because I remember in the in the book there is that diagram, which I've I've I was very happy when I saw this in the book because I've made the same diagram in videos on this channel in the past. But when you have the whole story structure and like the curve for the just general story structure, and then you break it down and every single chapter is one of those, and then you stack them in that same arc pattern, like you have to have the full arc every single time you have a scene. Yep. And actually, so I've changed since I went on tour and am teaching that and it, it changed the way I thought about teaching. And, and that's mm -hmm. the thing when you write, when you have to write a book teaching how to do something, mm -hmm. it, there's no better way to learn. I mean, you learn a bunch of stuff. Mm -hmm. about to stop sharing. Um, you learn a bunch of stuff when you're, when you're having to, to, to disseminate that information. Right. So I've actually improved. That's one of the reasons why I'm trying to do a second, second edition of that book. Mm -hmm because I actually teach things. I figured out better ways to teach what's in that book. Mm -hmm. And so my live classes and my recorded classes that are on Drake U, they actually do it the way I've discovered better ways. So one of the things is the scene. I think in the, in the book, I talk about there's four things that make up a scene, but now I teach that there's five things that make up a scene. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, I've actually added that. I was like, oh, wow, this is actually makes a little more sense and actually mm -hmm. puts a little more depth and everything like that. So, but, but it's the concept still the same. Yeah. You know, most people don't realize that a scene has to still have an arc. It mm -hmm. still has to do, it, it isn't just, it isn't just, oh, he's going to wake up and go downstairs and eat some breakfast and go catch the wagon for work because mm -hmm. I have to do that because they won't understand. If I just start him out in the field, like, how did he get there? What, you know, what's going on? That isn't what the scene is. That mm -hmm. is literally all that happens, but that's not the story. That is not what you consume. That is not what drives you to want to read the next chapter. That is not like, all of that is worthless. Mm -hmm. It's just a framework so that I'm forcing you to consume this other stuff to see what type of person he is. How would he? How does he interact with his mother? How does he interact with his the other adults in the house? How does he interact with his siblings? What is he thinking about? What is he worried about? What is he? What are his dreams for the future? Mm -hmm. Why is he so scared of this? What is it about his life that that is pretty much going to lock him into this? That it doesn't matter what he's dreaming about. Right. He lives in a society that there is no getting out of. Not mm -hmm. that they're slaves. Um, matter of fact, the crazy thing is they used to be slaves. And you actually find that out in the thing. But he's mm -hmm. like, oh, yeah, no, slavery of honest folk was banished a couple of generations ago. Yeah, but that means your great great grandfather was a slave living in the house that you live in, doing mm -hmm. the work that you do. Like, literally, mm -hmm. you're not a slave anymore. But really, you are. Because what can you do? Like, you were born here. You started farming when you were 12. You can't leave until you're 17. Mm -hmm. But the the you don't have any money you're in this they're called steads they're way they're like two three days out from any civilization because it's just farming um mm -hmm. it's a very dangerous world like, what are you gonna do mm -hmm. you're gonna and and that's another reason why they like they so the way they have set up the houses and again this is just me thinking about society but the way that the apartments are set up is they have two different families that live in each side Mm -hmm. Why do you do that? Because it gives you close, close proximity to the opposite sex that aren't your family right there in that, you know, you're going to eat dinner with them. You're going to mm -hmm. have that communal areas with them. And so, because what do they want? They want you to get married at 17. They want you to have kids at 18, 19, because mm -hmm. the more, the more that happens, the less likely you are to leave. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, and again, it's just understanding human society, understanding the, the mentality of people and why things work the way they work. Mm -hmm. And now it's running a character that's trying to rail against that. I don't want to do this. I don't want to, you know, and it, like one of the, my favorite scenes in the next chapter of his is he finally breaks down and admits this stuff to his cousin, mm -hmm. his cousin. So his cousin's an orphan. The, the cousin's parents died when he was a baby. And so they, these two, they're only two months apart. It's his mother's sister. Uh, who, and, and her f husband who died and mm -hmm. so they are, they're raising the cousin and so they really are just brothers they've, mm -hmm. they've lived in the same room their entire life and so he our dairy finally admits to him like you know he's like because I don't understand I don't understand why you're feeling this way and he's like because you don't understand it, there's this and there's that and there's this and his cousin's like dude but you are special everybody's known that you're so much better than everybody else and he's like yeah but I just I don't think so I just and that just pisses his cousin off because he's like I've got nothing I'm going to be a farmer and you're just sitting here whining away. And so again, that's just that way of, I don't need that for the, it's not that, that I need the cousin arguing with the, the with the um, character. It's my way to have the reader go, yeah, you are whining about stuff that, that I mean, obviously you're the protagonist. So you're some type of hero. You're going to go do something. Mm -hmm. You know, you probably have magic. Like, why are you a whiny little snot? And right. so just understanding 
how to craft these scenes and why we're going to put these scenes, <coughs> they're always for a reason. And again, that comes back to that chapter breakdown sheet. Mm -hmm. Because I've gone, what do I have to accomplish in the scene? Yeah. I have to make sure that the reader understands that, you know, in the first book, I give them the, the angst or in the first chapter, I give them the angst. Okay, great. That hooks them. They, they, they understand what the kid desires. But now I have to, I have to really explain that, that you're really a whiny little snot because of this. Like, mm -hmm. like things are going to happen. Why aren't you believing in yourself? And so how do I, so I go, okay, well, how are I going to do that? Well, I'm going to set up the scene with him and his cousin. He's going to finally admit this stuff. And his cousin going to be like, screw you. I am a farmer. It's like, that's all I've got. Like, and you're going to go off and do great things. And he's like, well, I don't know. I mean, uh, am I going to go do it? And so that's just, it endures. It's one more level that makes the reader go, wow, you know, this guy's got depth and he's real and he's, he's all these things. But why am I doing all that? So that you consume the theme. Right. That's it. That's where it's at. So um, if we go down to his major theme, because there's, you know, every one of them has a major theme. Mm -hmm. So the major theme for our dairy is, is it worth it to sacrifice yourself for what is right? So every in book one, everything is, is it worth it to sacrifice yourself? Mm -hmm. So a lift is, is it worth it to sacrifice yourself for independence? Mm -hmm. So she's never had that before. She's a tool. She does what she's told and she's never questioned it. Claim, mm -hmm. is it worth it to sacrifice yourself to fit in with society? Mm -hmm. um, our dairy is, is it worth it to sacrifice yourself to do the right thing? So obviously mm -hmm. he's going to be put in situations where you know, doing the right thing is not the thing that's going to be good for you. Mm -hmm. um, and is it worth it? And so, you know, once you know these major themes, and that's why, and again, everything has to tie in together. So the reason why right. all five of these themes tie in to, mm -hmm. is it worth it to sacrifice yourself for something? That means that the, the reader is consuming, not only are they consuming different themes through the different character story arcs, because these mm -hmm. stories don't even tie. That's one of the things I love about book one is, none of them even meet each other mm -hmm. it's literally four so it's five pov characters but one doesn't make it uh so it's really four pov characters mm -hmm. that um are islands they're short stories they're novellas whatever you want to say mm -hmm. they are written in parallel so there's a like like the ardari opening chapter and the clane opening chapter they both wake up at dawn. They both look out the window. They both have, um, it's completely different angst. One yeah. is a slave and one is a farm boy. The things that happen during the chapters kind of parallel each other in very different ways. One in a very dark, brutal way and one in a very lighthearted, I'm you know, a 17 year old that doesn't really in any danger or anything. But yeah. every chapter parallels itself as you go through right. all the books. So even though they don't touch physically, mm -hmm. I've you know, concentrated on, again, you can only do that when you're plotting. And so by plotting these scenes out and making sure that they're all basically rising at the same time, falling at the same time, you know, doing everything like that, it really connects the, the readers. And again, it's, it won awards in the original version. Mm -hmm. um, and I think one of the big things is, is because they don't even realize, readers don't even realize that they're reading four novellas. Mm -hmm. They just, it feels like it's just one story because mm -hmm. everybody, even though they're doing completely different things, they're still rising and falling. And, and having to deal with very similar situations. Right. And so, you know, these are the, th and, and again, I think very deeply about stories yeah. um, and everything is on purpose by design. There's no scene that I write, even like that stupid scene where they're arguing with, where the sister and the cousin argue. that is not done by accident. That is done specifically. So I've already shown you that uh, our dairy um, doesn't have a lot of confidence against his mom. He's about to sit down with the girl's father and not have a lot of confidence with that. But I want to show you that he is a, he is somebody that can take charge. And mm -hmm. so waking his cousin up was on purpose, having being the mediator between the cousin and the sister fighting on purpose, yep. it builds character. Everything is important. Mm -hmm. And so I just don't waste anything. Yeah. You know, that chapter's five and a half thousand words of just waking up, going to eat breakfast and going to catch a wagon to work. Mm -hmm. um, but nothing in there is wasted. Yeah. So long again there's no real answer to your question that's why I just was like let me just go down let me show you what I think about and maybe you can find yeah. an answer somewhere in there um it's why I, I really love the fact that I'm a plotter and that that mm -hmm. I thrive like because knowing where it's going makes me giddy to get there because mm -hmm. there's gonna be so much nuances that because I didn't like when I wrote the scene with the with the argument between the cousin and the sister no idea that was going to happen Mm -hmm. I, I opened the door. They're going in there. I do know that they're going to bump into dad because that mm -hmm. was in the plotting. But 
I literally was like, you know what? I haven't introduced their sister. I probably should do that. And so I was like, hey, Tari. And then I don't even know why, but she was like, hey, our dairy cousin. Like, and I'm like, well, obviously they're mad at each other. What's going on here? Like, I have no idea that they're happening. And then once I start going down the path, I'm like, oh, you know what? This is going to show, this is going to be good. This is going to show uh, that our dairy can take charge of this situation. And mm-hmm. so I just let it go. The muse told me I needed it. I follow her lead. I allow her to, to get me on the path. And then I use my writing skills and, and knowledge of what I need to do to use that to, to do what I need to do with it and connect the reader deeper to the character. Um, so, but again, I've been doing this for 30 years. Mm-hmm. So this is not something you're going to just do instantly. And I definitely was, I mean, there's a reason why I'm rewriting this book. Mm-hmm. Um, and I can't say this to my fan base, but I hate the original version of this book. <laughs> I despise it. The second book and on, even though it's not as written as well as what I can write now, none of, none of the, any, anything else that I've ever written do I despise. Mm-hmm. I despise the first book of the series. Mm-hmm. And if I'm now going to finish it up, because I've written the first three, I haven't written the last two, but uh, the third one was just never published. If I'm going to finish this up, I want to do it at the level that I'm at. Mm-hmm. now not the level that I was at when I wrote it yeah and so you know and mo- a lot of my beta readers are hardcore fans that have been fans of me for the beginning so mm-hmm. even though they're not ha- they especially weren't happy that I was because now they have even longer to wait for that third book right um but when I started sending them the the rewritten chapters they're like oh yeah you should rewrite this this is really good um and so they were happy with it which means all right, everybody's going to be happy and be willing to wait on me. I and mean, they already know that I had these health issues and there was really nothing that I could do mm-hmm. um, because of situations beyond my control. But um, now that hopefully I've beaten what I need to beat and I've got my brain back and I'm excited and motivated and focused mm-hmm. and all of this, hopefully we'll, we'll be able to do all this stuff. Well, it's a big kind of full circle moment in our conversation coming back to like the reader and focusing on the reader and making sure that, you know, all the just talking about character because we started the conversation talking about the purpose of story and how it is to connect to readers. And the one thing you need to do as a writer is be empathetic to people. And it's the same thing when trying to get them to connect to characters. It's all about empathy. It is. And understanding how to take advantage of that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, I think that that's probably a good place to end our conversation then since we've been going now for like three hours. <laughs> you weren't kidding when you said that this was probably going to run long. Well, do you want to tell everyone who's watching where they can find you, like tell them about Drake U and I'll just give them a rundown of your books and everything? So um, most of everything I have is out of print because mm-hmm. stuff we've already talked about through here. Uh, the only thing that's new that is fiction is the Snurse Imagine Magic Fairy Tale. I'm going to try to get Snarf Quest out um, in the next month or two. Drake U is my training website. It's just my name, Drake, and then the letter U.com. Um, there is a package up there now and a standalone um, because of the whole cancer thing and everything like that. Um, like the radiation took my beard. I lost 100 pounds. Um, I wasn't going to record anything without a beard because I looked horrible. And so now that it's finally, because there was a chance that it wasn't going to even grow back. Because mm-hmm. I actually lost all the hair from about here, including in the back, to about my chest level and I still don't have any hair on my back um mm-hmm. but you know I wasn't going to record videos like that because I look like a skeleton um chemo and radiation are horrible yeah. they are the horror show that everybody says they are it was eight months of just pain and misery and agony and I it can't even explain how horrible it was um but now I'm starting to record. I've got my office set back up to, um, I had to clean an area just to be able to record. Mm -hmm. So I did that this week and I'm starting to start, you know, to get back into that. So hopefully Mm -hmm. I'll start getting out, uh, training classes on that. Um, uh, two creative writing books are out. The, the one that you have here that we've been talking about the dynamic story creation, which will make you a better storyteller. I don't care what medium you write in. It's not medium specific. Mm-hmm. The other book is Better Writing Through Stronger Narrative, and it is all I have about that one here too. I have this one. Yep. Yeah. Have you read it? I I haven't. I've read half of it, and I haven't read the whole thing. I was going to try to finish it before we had our call, but I'm on a deadline for my book right now, and that's taking. I understand. Time. That's actually my favorite um, because it really does go into prose and yeah. like the power of prose. It, it's not grammar. That mm-hmm. this next book will be all about grammar. Um, and then I'm also writing a, um, a Hero's Journey version, my Hero's Journey version, the Max Alexander Drake Hero's Journey version. 
um, again, instead of just teaching it, I teach it and how to use it and why and the, you know, how to extract everything. Yeah. Um, but that won't be for another 2024 or whatever. Mm-hmm. Um, and then the things that I do have coming out, the first book of the Genesis saga, the stuff that I kind of showed here, um, slated to come out in June uh, of next year. And then the realm, the 20 novel thing, we're on track to drop the first of the 20 books in January of 2024. Mm-hmm. And the thing that I'm so excited about that is, and the reason why I've been writing on it for three years is once it starts dropping, it'll drop a brand new novel every three months for five years. Yeah. So basically by the time you finish one, you're just gonna be able to roll right into the next one. And these are not small novels. They're all 150 to 170,000 word novels. Um, incredibly well-written. The other three writers that are writing are my three protégés that I've had over the last 15 years. So they're very well-trained. Um, they trust me, you know, we're friends. Um, and it's just been a joy working on stuff. The marketing will start on that soon. We're, we're doing, we're recording things called, that we're calling realm round tables, where it's mm-hmm. like a 15 minute little video of us talking about an aspect, nothing about the story. So no spoilers, but like there's seven races in the world. So we do a round table on each one of the races. It's like, this is what we like about this race. And this is what's unique about this race. And this is what's cool about this race. And, mm-hmm. you know, so on and so forth. There's different magic systems. There's, you know, so we go into all these, it's a lot of world building stuff and a lot of prehistory stuff, like where the gods came from, which you'll never find out in the story because they're dead um and so and that's not a secret you you find that out very beginning Mm -hmm. but um so it's a lot of like how the gods were created and how they came to this dimension and what they did and why they're here and and all that stuff that Mm -hmm. just not gonna be in the story so i'm really excited about the dropping those we we, we will have eventually we'll have 24 of those recorded so we're dropping one every two weeks once they start dropping um in january is when the first one will drop so it'll go through all of 23 uh, we're also got a whole bunch of side stories and short stories that are not a part of the novels so that we're, mm-hmm. we're going to be, if you join up the, for the uh, news group or news newsletter. And then that's the last thing to join the newsletter. Um, mm-hmm. The best way is to go to my main website, which is starvingwriterstudio.com. So all single starvingwriterstudio.com. I'll link it in the description of the yep. videos. Um, and you can join the mailing list there. You can check out, there's some information on the cartoon. There's some information on the, the creative writing book. I mean, the creative writing books, there's some information on Drake Hugh there and everything like that. They don't have the store up yet. Um, so that's my new marketing team. So they've redone my entire web presence and they've redone all my website. So they're still working on some things, but the store should be open mm-hmm. soon with a couple of different products and some t-shirts and some stuff like that. Um, because I have drawn quite a bit for the cartoon and so, I've made some t-shirts out of them and stuff like that. Um, So yeah, I've got a lot going on. Thank you all so much for watching this video. I hope you found it as helpful as I did. If you did, make sure to like it and also subscribe to my channel. I have authors on like Drake talking about their writing processes and the way that they approach writing and their own takes on craft. I also make a lot of videos reviewing different writing craft books like I did for Drake's book Dynamic Story Creation and sharing all of the resources that I feel helped make me a better writer. Also make sure to go check out Dynamic Story Creation as well as Drake's book on Point of View and his book The Holy Book on Grammar which is going to be coming out early in 2023. I hope you have a fantastic week and as always happy writing.